interesting. Penultimate session of the two very interesting days of Turf 2020. I'm joined in this session on Sports for Development, also uh, commonly referred to as S4D, a game changer for Indian society. As we all know, the UN recognizes sport as an important enabler of sustainable development. And we are going to today talk to the people who helm this very important initiative, are actively advocating adoption of best practices in this area, and those who are working at the grassroots to actually drive the change. So first up, I want to uh, ask you to join, uh, ask you to uh, welcome in this very young, very dynamic and committed Suhail Tandon, who is the founder of Pro Sports Development, PSD. Suhail has over 10 years of diverse international experience in countries like uh, UK, Canada, India, uh, in the fields of sports development, coaching, and management. And as we know, is passionate towards development of youth and grassroots sports in India. Uh, in India, he has collaborated with many storied institutions to aid the development of youth via sports uh, across 12 states in India, uh, several rural and semi-urban locations. Uh, amongst all his other qualifications, I thought it'd be interesting to also tell you that he's a certified cricket coach from the England and Wales Cricket Board. Suel and his team at PSD uh, have done this, uh, you know, have conducted this extremely interesting scoping study, which is going to form part of this conversation that we are having uh, today. A fireside chat without the fireside, totally virtual, but hey, you know, anything goes on the virtual platform. So he will take you through this first ever scoping study on S4D uh, across uh, a study that was conducted across seven nations in South and Southeast Asia. And uh, I'll invite him to do that. He's also my co-host in this fireside chat with two amazing young ladies. Uh, the first of all uh, that I'd like to introduce is Aishwarya Segal. She's the Associate Program Coordinator with the Social and Human Sciences Unit at UNESCO, the New Delhi Cluster Office. Aishwarya has been with the United Nations for over five years and has focused on youth outreach, uh, sports for development, mm -hmm. and gender equality. Mm -hmm. She's also a national level swimmer. Um, and our third guest for the fireside chat, uh, the other amazing lady, is Ms. Neha Sahu. She's co founder Just for Kicks and Director Partnerships in Enabling Leadership. Uh, Just for Cakes was co-founded in 2011 and later merged into a, uh, a, a larger umbrella organization uh, called Enabling Leadership in 2018. Just for Cakes, a very evocative name, is now the football program mm -hmm. to develop life skills and leadership skills mm -hmm. at Enabling Leadership. So let's begin on the structure of today's 45 minutes. Uh, we will have um, Suhail take us through the scoping study on S4D. And Suhail and I will then settle down to a brief chat on the implications and learnings of the study, how it can throw light on the landscape for development of youth in India via sports. Uh, what are the differences? What are the challenges that we've seen from the study vis-a-vis what both UNESCO and Just for Cakes have experienced uh, firsthand. So on to you, Suhail. Uh, the next 15 minutes are yours. Uh, we'd love to listen to what you have done in the scoping study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shabnam, for that lovely introduction um, and letting people know that I'm a certified cricket coach. That gets overlooked. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, so please let me know if you can see that. Um, um, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So uh, first of all, I have the privilege and the honor to release the scoping study on behalf of Fikki, PSD, uh, as well as Priya, uh, titled Understanding the Sport for Development Sector in South and Southeast Asia. And I'll now proceed quickly towards uh, speaking about uh, uh, the same. 
and what we found through it. So hope everyone can see the presentation. Yes, very much. Excellent. Um, so yeah, as uh, Shabnam very aptly mentioned, the United Nations uh, has recognized sport as an important enabler of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are basically a universal call for action to end poverty, uh, to protect the planet and ensure all people live with uh, peace and prosperity by the year 2030. So ambitious agenda, but uh, you know all the UN countries have signed up to it. Uh, there are 17 goals in total and 169 associated targets. And from these uh, goals and targets, um, you know, specific uh, uh, SDGs have been identified that sport uh, can have an impact on, including, for example, those on the screen, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, reduce inequalities, uh, and peace and justice. And obviously, there's goal number 17, partnerships for the goals. Uh, personally, I feel is very important to collaborate uh, with diverse stakeholders, even uh, in sport and development, uh, to enable uh, enable these goals. Um, so I'm going to move right uh, into the study. Um, and uh, just to give an overview of, of the study, um, uh, the study was conducted to learn in depth about the sport for development sector and various initiatives uh, in South and Southeast Asia. Um, the other objective was to identify key gaps and challenges that the sector faces. And finally, uh, you know, to, set, uh, to provide a set of practical recommendations to various stakeholders, part of the sport for development sectors in the regions to guide future strategies. Just a note, uh, though India is a key player in the sport for development sector globally, for this study, India was not a part of the same as there have been various studies conducted previously in relation to sport for development in the country. But, uh, you know, we will be linking it uh, uh, later on in our fireside chat to uh, what's happening in India and if there is uh, a convergence of the study uh, with, with the sport for development sector in India. So uh, what was our methodology? Um, we reached out to 105 stakeholders across seven focus countries that we identified. Uh, these include uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, as well as Indonesia. And we had various uh, data collection tools that we used to gain first-hand data from stakeholders. We really wanted uh, to hear the, the voice of the sport for sport for development sector and community uh, from these uh, regions. So in total, we had 27 survey respondents. Uh, we conducted in-depth individual key informant interviews with 14 of them. And we also led uh, three focus group discussions uh, with stakeholders in different countries uh, um, identified part of this uh, study. Um, one thing is uh, to remember that the study was actually conducted while uh, COVID uh, was raging you know, in, in the regions. Uh, so um, the numbers could have been higher, but I think given all the challenges, uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think the study did, did well. Um, so what did we find out? Um, in terms of sport for development programming, uh, there were three key focus areas that emerged. Um, one was gender equality, uh, the other was youth development, and the third was education. And these align uh, well uh, with uh, the SDGs, uh, related SDGs. So there's for the programming in South and Southeast Asia, um, target SDG 5, gender equality, 91% of respondents said that, uh, followed by quality education, 71% respondents. Uh, and thereafter, good health and well-being, uh, with over half of the respondents uh, targeting that uh, um, SDG. So what were the popular sports? Uh, uh, it's no surprise that uh, you know football was by far the most popular sport um, across the regions. Um, um and, and as you can see in uh, in in the quotes there that have been taken from the data collected for the study football was chosen uh, a because it's low cost low investment 
uh, B, it has a global appeal. C, it's a team sport. Uh, so a lot of S4D pro programming prefer a team sport uh, as uh, it's uh, easier to um, deliver some of the learning outcomes. And largely, it can involve large number of people and teams. However, that's come into uh, question due to obviously COVID-19 and several stakeholders across these regions are, are struggling with that as well in terms of how to make their football programming work. Interestingly, a third of the respondents also utilize unconventional sports. So sports like uh, skating, martial arts, um, and then another third utilize a multi-sport programming or curriculums, uh, which use uh, various different sports and physical activities to deliver uh, their programs. Uh, so very interesting mix of, of sports, but football by, by far stands out. So what are the sources of funding for S4D programming? Um, yeah, if we see here, uh, almost uh, two thirds of the funding is from foreign funds, whereas only one third is uh, national and local funds. Uh, and I think this uh, uh, holds true uh, in India as well, though it's changing. So if you see the type of funding uh, on the right hand side of the screen, um, you know, three fourths of the respondents receive institutional funding. A close second, 65% or, you know, receive private sector funding, which includes CSR funding. And that's something to look at in uh, the Indian context as well. And interestingly, 50% respondents, uh, you know, rely on individual donations to support their programming, which we found uh, quite uh, interesting. So what were the challenges? Uh, funding is always a challenge, uh, not just in the sport for development sector, but, uh, you know, um, all sectors, I think. Um, but this was the biggest challenge identified uh, by the respondents. The next two were uh, government and policy inaction, uh, as well as a lack of advocacy for sport for development programming and research into the sport for development sector. So hopefully this uh, study is also a first step towards uh, bridging uh, these, these gaps. Um, a fourth uh, challenge identified was a lack of qualified trainers. Um, uh, and even though in the survey, most of the respondents did not uh, identify programming challenges, um, you know, in the interviews, uh, there definitely came out a, a few uh, programming challenges. And these were basically a lack of space in urban areas, um, you know, and the second was a lack of long term participation. And, and this, uh, you know, was um, very interesting. Uh, and I think the quote below uh, really sums it up, you know, and I'm just gonna not read it out word by word, but summarize it. It basically says that most people look at sports as a competitive thing, and don't look at sports as a development uh, tool that can help change behavior, especially for children. Uh, so this is quite telling. Uh, and this applies to various stakeholders within the community, um, uh, you know, funders, donors, uh, as well as within the government. So I think, uh, and that's why the advocacy becomes uh, uh, very important. Obviously, as part of the study, we could not, uh, you know, overlook the impact of COVID-19 on S4D programming and organizations in the region. Um, and very interesting insights uh, from this. Um, so. 67% uh, respondents did believe that programs must include greater online learning, but there was um, also recognition by various stakeholders uh, that this can be very challenging, especially with the demographics they work with, because they do not have access either to the internet or they do not have uh, IT infrastructure um, uh, you know, to, to be connected online. So though it was identified that this is something that must be done, uh, the challenges were also uh, uh, clearly identified. Um, second, uh, respondents said that the programs must focus more on public health and well-being, uh, given uh, the challenges imposed by COVID. Um, 
more than half of the organization said that due to covid they'll have to think of overhauling the medium and long term strategy which was uh, significant uh, um and lastly in the short term almost half of the respondents believe that the s4d programming must focus on individual activity so given this uh, you know how does football fit in uh, moving forward uh, is to be seen so what were the recommendations uh, we've uh, divided the recommendations into six main themes uh, the first being advocacy so as i've been mentioning advocacy for the sport for development field is is key and uh, uh, it was felt that advocacy within communities also uh, with funders and policy makers is important so advocacy at all levels and not just uh, at one level uh, in terms of funding um, uh, the key recommendations included greater collaborations uh, with various stakeholders so that instead of competing with existing uh, funds you know s4d organizations and other stakeholders can collaborate to access greater full pools of funding um there was also the suggestion of creating alternate revenue streams to um to sustain and grow programs uh, such as looking at a social enterprise model and finally uh, one main aspect uh, uh, that needs to be focused on moving forward is to um is to identify sport for development programs and the impact they have uh, on specific development objectives rather than just focusing on the sport aspect of their programming and this uh, many stakeholders recognize this and they feel that they need to align better with the development objectives so again i mean it will be great if you know s4d programs uh, uh, specifically identify with uh, um, the the sdgs uh, and other development national development objectives as well Uh, in terms of collaborations obviously funding uh, was uh, one that has already been mentioned uh, but also there was uh, there's knowledge sharing uh, so knowledge sharing within the sector uh, and beyond the sector needs to increase uh, and lastly uh, you know collaborating with relevant stakeholders to mitigate issues of space and a lack of personnel uh, that were identified um for example in urban areas collaborating with uh, you know schools public private schools to deliver programming rather than uh, you know always creating independent infrastructure um the training of personnel uh, a very interesting uh, recommendation here that has come out is um to develop an accreditation system for sport for development trainers so that they can be provided the dual skills of a sports coach as well as a social worker with a focus on understanding of social issues and child protection so it was felt that um, you know many they either only uh, organizations could either, either only get hold of um, uh, social workers or sports coaches so they want to bridge that uh, gap and then that's something very interesting uh, you know for various stakeholders to look at um and then the the second uh, recommendation here was to you know identify youth coming out of the program and train them so that they can then become trainers within the program i know this happens in in many um uh, organizations many programs where i think it needs to be done more consciously by various uh, uh, various s4d stakeholders uh in the sustainability and program versatility uh, one uh, recommendation was to have robust monitoring and evaluation systems in place uh, in s4d programming which uh, gets feedback from the program participants uh, and and coaches and other key stakeholders so that programs can be altered uh, according to to the on ground needs and also an important aspect was documenting and showcasing the impact of s4d programming in the short term as well so that it can garner support for long term long term funding uh, as well um lastly in terms of navigating covid-19 um you know though it was identified that taking programs uh, online can be challenging two main suggestions were to pilot uh, online programming with smaller cohorts to see how it works before launching full scale 
and the second again i keep coming back to this but the second again is collaboration with other organizations so there are lots of organizations who have already developed uh, content and ways to de deliver uh, programs online so you know collaborating with such organizations could benefit uh, uh, all involved uh, the last uh, recommendation in in the covid-19 um, uh, space was that you know catering to the immediate needs of the communities um, you know so programs and organizations need to adapt and align their objectives to what is required on the ground and especially keeping covid-19 in mind it's it's had a wide ranging impact on on various stakeholders so i think sport for development programming needs to align uh, accordingly um so that's all from my end i'm just going to stop sharing my screen and i hope i kept within the time limit um so yeah over to you uh, shabnam Thank you. I'm just, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I'm just trying to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Suhail. Um, I think, uh, you know, what you've said really is what you've already discovered uh, in both South and Southeast Asia is something that I know Vicky was extremely interested in because can we integrate some of that information in your study? Um, and try and build in frameworks <clears throat> for, you know, because S4D is an effective tool. I mean, sports is an effective tool for development. And the fact that it hasn't truly been explored in the Indian space um, or even uh, the articulation of uh, this, this area of uh, uh, research um, and what we can get from it, um, I think if we are able to hear from Aishwarya and Neha um, on, on these aspects, uh, you know, it will start sort of forming for us as well, uh, truly actual, actionable and tangible, um, you know, steps taken uh, in the field. One thing that you said, uh, and which was part of the quote, which is that sports is not just a competitive tool but it's a social and behavioral change. Uh, brings to mind a fairly uh, com compelling and large uh, experiment that was undertaken in New York's Bronx uh, with basketball, right? Uh, I think uh, part of uh, the police force as well as the administrative uh, um, uh, you know, government action taken to get the youth of Bronx to participate in basketball after school or through the day and through several months of doing this uh, they began to see a tremendous improvement in the reduction by the reduction of crime in bronx and i mean these are the kinds of stories i mean while we may you know um, uh, place them around you know policy and uh, you know jargon but truly, this is what actually S4D is. It can develop across all the UNDP goals. It can develop across a few, but it will impact and build and create behavioral change. So Aishurya, um, I was just wondering if you can uh, take us through the fact that UNESCO has a global presence, right? And it has interest in supporting uh, the S40 approaches across Asia. You are part of the New Delhi cluster office. Um, what from this study, as well as from your own learnings in particular, uh, do you believe? And it'd be great if you can provide us with anecdotal, you know, stories and how S40 uh, has directly impacted behavior, social change, social economic change. So, uh, on to you, Ashwini. Uh, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, from my own experience, I mean, uh, I am a national level swimmer, so I this this issue is of course very very personal to me. And in my personal experience as a national level swimmer, now as a practitioner in the field, I would say that the progress um, in the sports for development field is gradual. 
obviously there's no arguing with the advantages of engaging in competitive sports at school uh but i feel and i i totally echo what you said i feel that sports doesn't always have to be competitive in nature to be enjoyed and in my time uh, and that's obviously not a very long time ago it was more about excelling in sports to use sports uh to get into college you know use the sports quota and in national level competitions as well i remember interacting with a lot of girls for whom excelling and winning was a means to improve their families economic circumstances so what this does is put put immense amount of pressure and it doesn't allow for sports to be enjoyed in its essence and this is why unesco is working with the government and a lot of private sector partners to mainstream physical education into the larger school curriculum uh across india because we feel that this is a well functioning model and daily sports sessions as part of the academic calendar allows to allows for students to meet their daily um physical education and physical activity targets whilst also improving cognitive functioning and at the grassroots as well unesco is encouraging sports activities by working with civil society partners to set up training facilities in areas where physical physical education may be scarce um I, i mean as you said the idea should be first and foremost for every child to enjoy the benefits uh, that sports has to offer and as the scoping study suggests and as suhail also briefly mentioned we do acknowledge the challenges with respect to the sports for development uh, sector in india and these of course have been compounded by the covid-19 pandemic res- resulting in growing inequalities and also especially gender related inequalities which is why we feel that we need more innovative solutions to uh tackle this sort of uh, these sort of inequalities and sports actually is this innovative solution that embodies this hope for many including unesco um the current emergency context actually calls for using sports and particularly grassroots sports as a creative tool for achieving the un sustainable development goals and this is in fact a strategy that is already being applied in conflict areas by the un where physical and social barriers much like the ones we face right now constantly pose challenges to the um, implementation of the sdgs so in line with the recommendations of the report unesco has been raising awareness on the power of sport as an equalizer for social inclusion and gender equality as it can bring bring people together from different cultures religions ethnicities which is extremely important actually in the diverse, diverse social matrix of india i would like to uh, ask you to hold a thought on the experiments or actual you know ground level uh, initiatives that you wanted to take in crisis areas mm-hmm. we'll come back to that because those make for a both compelling stories uh, of of what works right it it's not just a great policy on on paper uh neha you been right there right with football and and uh, uh working uh, to uplift uh, something similar i'm hoping uh, to what had happened in the bronx and probably on a far larger scale with far many challenges so would you like to just take us through uh, your um uh, you know understanding and and your experience uh on on this hi shabnam and hi everyone thank you for giving me this chance to actually speak about something extremely close to my heart um i've been on the other side let's say uh, from aishwarya and suhail um uh, i failed at sport uh, time after time year after year uh, through the competitive structures that we are talking about and that's where my lessons came from so that's literally point number 1 of the beauty of sport for development that then pushed me to use sport as the vehicle for change right and uh, very interesting shabnam that you started with the bronx story uh, i was inspired to come back to india and then use football as a tool of change uh because i was actually working with public schools in bronx and harlem uh not with sports but in education and i was actually wowed by the fact that the same level of disparity and inequalities existed in that country uh i really wanted to come back and do something for my country first off um so in 2011 uh, i was actually teaching in a government school uh in mumbai um the large city of mumbai and um i realized that there was nothing like sport 
or even physical education that was formally being conducted in these schools. I was in a government school um, and there was just a namesake period, uh, but no real physical activity. Uh, luckily for me, I was challenging. I was really struggling and I was thoroughly challenged to teach students in a school environment. Uh, and so I took to sport almost as an experiment. We are talking about literally 10 years ago. Uh, football was a chosen sport for all the reasons that Suhail spoke about uh, the beauty of just that one football, no other resources. And we had children running to the ground, leaving classes from a three-story municipal building right in the middle of the city. Uh, because why? A lot of them didn't care about football. Uh, they saw freedom, space, and the opportunity to play and enjoy themselves. And what I got to convert that into as a first teacher and then converted coach uh, was into some miraculous things. They were miraculous for me at that time. And today they are called sport for development. Simple things. One, students just started coming to schools regularly. Uh, we went from attendance rates of 25% students showing up on a daily basis to literally 75% within a month. You're talking 30 days time period. Uh, but some things that are really close to my heart are simple things of similar to Bronx. In India, there is enough uh, trouble with substance abuse. Uh, there is enough trouble with uh, poverty and disinvestment in school and hence getting into all kinds of crimes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations, especially NGOs, tackling these issues. And we did it. I did it myself with sport at Just for Kicks. We were able to engage these populations. They loved coming to school, learning through this. They didn't have time, but they were building goals for themselves, setting goals, and had that drive and focus to literally change themselves. So some stories that I still remember every day of my life to keep me going are students who had difficulties learning uh, and were diagnosed with different learning issues in the classroom uh, were excelling on the field just because of the sport taking on leadership roles like captaincy of the team and automatically confidence levels were skyrocketing next thing you know academics were good um, next thing um, everyone was respecting them and these were exactly the same students that were going and bullying the teachers at the young age of 10. Uh, students who were looking for what to do in their communities, so-called basties and mohallas in India, uh, really found a purpose for themselves at their early teenage years of 13, 14. And hence, they didn't have time to engage in any other activities and sit and talk, chat about uh, distractions that would take them away from, be it simple social emotional development or curricular, co-curricular development. So um, that's what we got to see firsthand. And I think over the years, it's just proved to me, I think for me, why sport becomes extremely powerful is the number of sport available. Um, and it's such a common uniting factor across the world, right? Every world has it. So whenever you're able to connect and learn or share your challenges with any other um, stakeholder, participant, collaborator, maybe in Asia or even across the world, it's very easy to be speaking the same language uh, through the medium of sport, whatever it might be, and then uh, working together. Right? I think both Suhail and Aishwarya spoke about collaboration, uh, working together, which is so important. And I think sport just makes it so easy in itself. You're not trying to create a brand new framework. You have these games. Uh, no matter how um, how diverse they might be, they still have a common uniting factor and have this inbuilt capacity to create development. Um, and I love calling the development, it's physical, it's emotional, it's social, and my final word there becomes professional because what we're trying to do is now use the same sport to have our young students graduate from schools uh, all the way, go to 10 standard, finish it, and then get into internships, get into colleges, um, get jobs based on the choice they want to make after going through a sport development cycle. Not, hey, you become a footballer because you went through the Just for Kicks program. Um, I think I'll pause at that, Shabnam. Uh, that's been our story of change through sport and sport for development. Thank you, Neha. Very inspiring to hear the story. I, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about 
your beginning. And I'm so happy of the coincidence that, you know, you were partly, you were there in the Bronx and you were seeing this happen. So uh, emotional, social, physical, and professional, you say, right? I think, uh, again, a, a great way to explain or at least put down the expectations or the contours of where you will see the change. So, Hel, what is your story? Why did you come into this? I mean, I know I've read, you know, your bio, and but that's just, you know, I'd love to hear uh, it the way, I mean, you know, for me, it was a discovery on what Neha has gone through and what propelled her uh, to come back to make that change. What propels you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think everyone working in sport for development has a backstory. <laughs> it's... It's not something, you know, you uh, at least uh, 10 years back would say that, yes, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, basically, um, so all my, you know, professional academic qualifications aside, um, I was always interested in working with uh, youth, working at the grassroots in sports. And our first project was uh, in rural Odisha with uh, with an organization called Gram Vikas there. And we were working with uh, Adivasi children through through uh, schools run by Gram Vikas. And um, the idea was to, you know, uh, deliver sports programs, uh, part of the uh, school curriculum, and uh, basically develop the sporting talent that we knew that the tribal kids had. So we went with that approach. And very soon, we realized that, uh, you know, sport was having a much bigger impact. Also, initially, there was an incident where we, one of the sports was weightlifting and uh, you know one of the promising female lift, weightlifters who was about 15 never returned to school after summer vacation and then when we inquired we learned that she had gotten married so you know we were struck with sort of the ground reality and and then at that point we said that you know we can't just use sport for the sporting development of these young people we need to focus on the holistic development, all the on the all-round development that that Neha mentioned. Um, so that's what so that that was a shift of vision at that point, and we said, you know, that we're going to focus specifically on sport for development and using sport as a tool uh, for development, with all the added benefits that it brings, such as improving participation at the grassroots, also improving the talent pool, because there will be some kids who go. So that sort of is is the story, and and I think one thing I want to add here is, in terms of you know why we are sort of looking at you know conducting research in the field as well. Um, I think initially five six years back, you know, the vision always is reach out to as many children as possible, which is great. It's still the vision, but I think you know advocacy research into the sector and changing attitudes and mindsets of of uh, uh, people looking at how they look at sport is very important so i think till we don't do that like you know it it will be sluggish uh, the movement towards sport for development suhail and and actually a question posed to all of you i think in suhail's uh, uh, study uh, and one of the sad but real uh, situations is lack of funding, right? Uh, sports for development is is truly a movement. It's not, you know, it's not a sponsorship. It's not something I'm going to get in short term, six months, dalo, and you know, I will get all the benefits, and you know, I can then uh, go around and see it and tom tom it in my company and talk about the impact and the measures. It's not that, right? Sports for development by itself means it is a change it's a generational decadal uh, change uh, that we hope we will see i mean fit for india that is being run by the government i mean it's still while it, it it's moving it's growing but the the the, the base is belief uh, that this is something that is going to truly underpin um, all positive development in youth but that's a long call, right? Corporates don't see it that way. Governments have short-term priorities. Public-private participation, I, I don't know how many are willing to 
um, look at this beyond just lip service and for the short term? How how will we ever bridge this gap? Is it always going to be government pushing this and and a few very few committed souls like yourselves who will try and drive the agenda? How does it work? Neha, Soel, Aishwarya, how, how, how do you think this is going to work without the kind of funding that is required? I think I can get started with this one. So uh, I'll take it to the root of this. I think scope for development in India is still a prevalent term. Uh, it's a spoken about term. I am not confident about how well people understand and implement it. And when I'm talking about people, everyone, even in the ecosystem, and that's what translates into the problem we are seeing. Um, people still understand sport and the power of sport. Sport for development needs a lot more advocacy, uh, marketing. I'll use that word as well. Speaking about conversation in the media, popular media everywhere, and it can't be restricted to uh, champions, heroes, well-wishers, doers, like the few that we keep seeing. Uh, and I'm happy that there are scoping studies like this happening. I think talking about the funding issue directly, it's a, it's a, it's a connected point, right? And I would say that there's definitely been progress in India. Uh, simply talking from experience, my experience as well as other organizations working in the field. And we are a not-for-profit entity, so we are purely relying on uh, grants, CSR sponsorship, right? We're not, uh, we're actually not cross-subsidizing and making any revenue. 2000, early starts of 2000s, nothing at all. 2010 to 15, extremely uh, poor environment, uh, only international recognition and grant availability. But 2015 to where we find ourselves right now, 2020, it has picked up. Uh, and the issue has been that of mindset, right? Everyone who mentioned that word, that's actually spot on. The mindset issue has been that of uh, we as a country tend to understand the value of sport uh, coming next after education, which we call academics. We are not able to integrate it. And that change has been slow for the masses, no matter where you are, whether you're in the uh, government, the school management, um, and it becomes a, a case of opportunity. If an international school has it, a middle income school has it, the government schools, they don't know what, why is that needed at some levels when Padhai studying is not taking place. And that percolates to the funders, right? When you, I have spent years, I spent the first five years at Just for Kicks just trying to convince my funders, we're talking of against CSR funders about why and they're telling me how many championships have these children won how many state competitions where do they stand and i am my conversation is about oh by the way we are working with 3500 children out of which 50 percent are girls isn't that fantastic and my goal is not for them to become champions and win trophies however they have some of them went to uk some went here they're like can you tell us what percentage made it to the top and I'm like, this conversation is not making sense let's just pause let me tell you why i'm doing this and revisit and that is a mindset change, and that's not going to happen till we have enough data out there, right? Research out there. And that's why I look to studies like this to make this popular, because I also don't think we can expect everyone in the country to understand it without reading enough and getting enough, uh, let's say, positive reinforcement, for lack of a better word, enough studies and findings. Uh, of course, I find myself doing it firsthand, hence believe in it. But this really needs to take a forefront right now because I truly believe there's a lot of good work that has happened in the last three years in the sport for development field. But I myself struggle to dig out the findings. So I think uh, I don't really always blame. I'm just trying to make sure how do we uh, promote and talk about this more. I think I'll hand it over to anyone else now. I sure, yeah. I can, uh, in in yeah. you know, you know the space of yeah, where UNESCO is, are there? Because everyone's looking not only for studies, uh, but the stories behind those studies, right? That makes compelling uh, both uh, of course reading, uh, you know, impact. Uh, it, it is therefore then the barometer for success, and the success is not like Neha said, the medal but the success of the impact over an expanse of young people. 
can you throw some light on that? Uh, I mean, this is why we uh, look towards extending our partners uh, across the country, especially with grassroots organizations, because this is where we get the most beautiful stories from. And this is where change is mu much needed. And of course, with respect to, uh, you know, furthering private public partnership, it is ever more important because that's where most of the funding comes from. And that's how we can uh, go and work in these, uh, you know, remote parts and get these beautiful stories like you described. Obviously, it is evident that the SDGs are cross cutting across different sectors of the economy. And in order to make it uh, more comprehensible for their business like sensibilities, we obviously need to look at the business motivation behind effective private sector engagement in sports for development. A great example actually of a cross cutting goal is perhaps the SDG nine, which is building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. Now, obviously, it sounds very idealistic when I say it, uh, but if we break it down for the private sector to say that mainstreaming gender and investing in sports, especially at the grassroots le level, uh, would help to empower women and improve learning outcomes in, uh, in schools and also in some cases actually help keep children in school. It may sort of arouse their interest because we all know that in order to foster innovation, which is the SDG, we need to in invest in skilling of the youth. And uh, with the many proven benefits that sports has to offer, seeing it as complementary to academics is the only sustainable way to ensure resilience for these organizations. So uh, with the growing uh, sort of awareness about the benefits of using sports as a potent tool for development, the investment appetite has definitely increased in the sector and the private, se private sector could step in to fill this gap and also collaborate to bring the best practices to bear. And in this respect, UNESCO is supporting the National Alliance for Women's Football, which is again a grassroots initiative where we get these stories from. We we go. Uh, this is where we per percolate sort of our SDGs to the very bottom, and it is a platform uh, to promote social transformation and women's empowerment for gender equality through sport. This is a very eff effective example of uh, public-private partnership because it's a unique initiative that includes diverse partners for advancement of women's football in India, such as the government, the All India Football Federation, uh, diverse range of players, clubs, uh, academies, NGOs, educational institutions, UN agencies, the media, commercial leagues, corporate bodies, etc. I mean, let's not forget that India is a sport loving nation. So from a business point of view, it definitely makes a lot of sense to invest in sports for development. And as uh, I'm just going to echo what Neha said and pick up on all the things she said, there is enough empirical data to support the fact that children who play sports develop various life skills and also show improved cognitive functioning and academic performances. So from my own personal experiences as a national level swimmer, I would go as far as to say that participating in a sport also empowers girls and women with leadership skills and this sort of confidence uh, that helps them take over their lives and also their goals. Therefore, I mean, it, it's, it's obvious that investing in sports, much like investing in education, has the potential to create a much more productive workforce, which is ultimately in the benefit of the private sector at the end of the day. Um, so, well, um, I think Aishwarya has uh, prevented, uh, presented, uh, you know, a, a, a great framework uh, that we can look at from your uh, lens, you know, someone who's building strategies and, and collating data uh, to help um, uh, what is happening both at the ground as well as with policy. Um, is there anything that you feel that you'd like to say or ask of Neha and Aishwarya? Um, yeah, I I think uh, thanks Neha Aishwarya. Those all those points are pertinent. I I think um, uh, you know everything that you said needs to be done. I think one thing that I would just add here, Shabnam, is that um, you know as stakeholders of the sector, we are the ones who need to. Uh, inform people, talk about S4D and its benefits. Because if we don't talk, no one will listen. 
and i think platforms such as these are important uh, you know this has given s4d space um, for us to talk about what it's all about and its impact and reach it usually you know what i've seen is s4d gets constrained to just the development sector it needs to go beyond that uh, and i think we need to build platforms where where that can be done um yeah i think um, uh, you know one one question i i i have uh, is and that i get asked a lot is how how do you measure the impact of s4d especially on the sdgs um you know because uh, you know uh, any funder would like to see i mean for me as well the stories are what count and the stories are what matter but i think there is a, a you know a, a thinking that there needs to be more measurement so how how do we do that how can we do that is that happening currently so um, just to get your thoughts on it should i go first yes please it has okay with that yes please um i mean how do you measure it? it's a very complicated question because again if you're saying if you're talking about measurement then you're again coming back to you know being it being competitive versus uh using sport actually to uh bring forth the various benefits that it has to offer uh for us it's more about you know realizing that sports has the uh, power to reach out to the masses and um in fact i think this was a couple of months back when the pandemic had just begun and uh, i think prime minister modi very um, vocally spoke about uh, his wish to capitalize on uh, and promote the values of sports to send out a message message of um, positivity during this pandemic and this was a conference with various sports persons um, you know discussing how how sports can be used to sort of cope with the mental ment uh, you know mental and physical challenges during the uh, pandemic and just connecting it to the sdgs and how it could uh, be used to promote the sdg on good health and well-being and obviously partnership for the goals and this actually very directly echoes the unesco kazan action plan which uh, world governments are party to and its approach to use sport as a potent tool to promote health prospects and collective action which is ever more important in the context that we're living in right now uh, the framework supports governments in tracking the success of their sports based programs which also helps sports for development communities to elaborate the evidence based arguments for investing in sports so i think Uh, to answer this answer your question there's already sort of this framework that unesco pushes forward and in india specifically unesco is building on its commitments to advance the sustainable development goals in providing policy advice on strategies and supporting projects to promote equal access to and participation for all in sports and physical education particularly women and girls and persons with disabilities and i just like to state one example for that um through the ability spark program which is an inclusive digital physical education program in south asia uh unesco and omoya uh, our partner omoya sports are um uh, trying to uh, get people uh, parents caregivers family and special educators to uh, use sport as a tool for greater inclusion and also uh, to, uh, to uh, promote a shift towards physical and men mental well-being during the covid-19 pandemic further to enable sustainable development through sport unesco has also created a regional youth and sport task force as a mechanism for harnessing trans the transformative power of uh, youth at the grassroots level in the asia pacific and uh, from my experience i mean we've certainly seen a lot of youth driven uh, civil society organizations working across india to drive social change through sports and advance on the sdgs so um again i think there's no tangible way to sort of measure the impact but when you have you know we have these sort of tentacles if i may call them in all uh, uh, you know all parts of india through our civil society partners and especially youth youth driven programs where we can see these stories of change come forward so i think this is pretty much the only way that we ensure that uh, the work that we are doing is impactful 
Yeah, I think so. Hail, uh, you might find. Yeah, do you have any such? Yeah. Yes, yes, I definitely like to comment on this question. Uh, yeah, measurement. I think the most frequently asked question uh, for us as well, and for most, in fact, uh, no matter whether we are talking about international funding bodies or Indian, that is the hot topic, and almost I would like to say the decision maker uh, in the twenty twenties. Um, I think we are lacking. It is a specialized area. Uh, whether you call it measurement, you call it monitoring and evaluation. uh it has always existed but it hasn't been um advanced enough or we've not been able to see enough uh people organizations uh within india uh within sport and within sport for development that's the gap right now uh again um a lot of positive changes happened just in the last 3 years uh there are a lot of tools internationally available to measure development social emotional development and everything that sport does so either looking up to these tools and then adapting it with some expert advice to your program context uh in india now we've got a few good players and tools i think dreamer dreamer is one of the well known life skills assessment tools there are many more uh, i'm sure unesco has a lot of different uh, examples as well as tools um so i think it's really important for every organization uh that is working in s4d to start doing this and the newer ones that are starting off it's much easier because for the ones that were that have existed for 10 years 20 years or it's difficult to change the entire program cycle and adapt though we have to do it i think uh, stories of change were the most compelling thing for me definitely but i very soon realized that's not good enough for everyone and i am completely on board uh with that it makes complete sense when you're trying to present data about how 50000 students lives have changed youth lives have changed you do need a blend and a mix of that and um i think it's really important for such studies and papers to have as well and hence i definitely urge everyone to start looking at measurement as step almost step 1 the foundation step when you're designing your program luckily we are in a place with a lot of tools right now so today sohail i feel more confident if i was starting off today i'd feel like i've got this uh, i think uh, it took us time to learn uh, but now we've got uh, expertise within india itself to help us with it thank you neha thank you neha sorry ishwarya uh, shabnam no, 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 uh, this is wonderful one. to hear yes i just wanted to yes, add one course, thing i think yeah. just one reflection i think Uh, again very apt responses just a question for all of us to think about moving forward is do we also uh, do we need to change the way we see how we measure the impact of s4d you know uh, is that something because both of you have alluded to the fact that stories are important the actual change intangible change is important so are we should we not just rely on numbers is something that i think all of us uh, need to think about back back to you shabnam No, I'm. I'm just. You know, this is extremely interesting. So I'm not going to let you guys go in a hurry. <laughs> I've got, you know, Fiki allowing me a few more minutes. So I had to put all three of you in a spot, right? So Suhail has come back and said that there. Sorry, five development goals that we've looked at, uh, that he's looked at in his scoping study, and I'll just read them out very quickly for all five of you, uh, all three of you. Uh, we had gender equality, youth development, improving educational outcomes, social inclusion, and good health and well-being. Right now, that's for the scoping study, and he's he had also listed out how each of these SDGs fared. but in the specific area for india if you had to select two to focus on because i'm of the you know the the clear um, you know a point of view that focus will truly help us you know cut through everything and therefore even outcomes measurements etc becomes a lot easier uh yes uh, great if there is any kind of additional development that does happen but by focus you are able to be clear what would be those two sdgs that you believe are most important for india in the next 5 to 10 years ashwarya 
Why don't you wish that? <laughs> I mean, this... and why, of course. <laughs> I, it's, 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 yeah, because we'll have to close this up. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I can pick one because, uh, you know, uh, representing the UN, it's like picking a favorite I child. I know, for that's why I said I'm putting you in a spot. <laughs> that's why I'm putting you so, in a spot. You have to pick two, not one. I mean, I would in, in in instead, I would say that all goals are extremely important and interdependent, actually, in a way that one cannot be achieved without the other. For example, uh, say gender equality, the goal on gender equality would enable mothers to be empowered enough to make informed decisions about their child's nutrition and, um, you know, educational prospects, uh, thus helping to achieve the SDGs on good health and well-being and quality education. So I think advancing an individual SDG requires consideration of the other SDGs as well. Uh, I mean, the SDGs which operate within the ecosystem and each individual SDG is an input into the collective SDG ecosystem for greater synergies. And I guess pro uh, progress on one SDG does sort of ripple into progress for the other SDGs, which according to me should be leveraged within the development paradigm. Th this is my view. I, do, I cannot pick. <laughs> Spoken like a true UN person. <laughs> but you're right. I think the absolutely agree that there is a ripple and and there is a right each one will be associated and will impact the other and that's why the 17 goals are so beautifully uh you know thought through but i still want to put you in a spot so okay now i'm going to let neha be the one uh to let me know do you want to pick neha yes i will pick uh and I think it's pretty evident wherever I go, I've built the organization on those two. Uh, for me, I think it's uh, gender equality and uh, educational equality, right? Building um, education, improving educational outcomes. And I'll tell you why, uh, because I think, and I do not disagree one bit from what Aishwarya said. I'm just doing this, Shabnam. I'm trying to oblige as well by picking, but I'll give you the rationale for these. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I, I'll do that. So I think uh, education does form the, form the foundation of how we are thinking, that same behavior mindset that we started talking about. I realized that in my experience and with similar organizations that if we're able to tackle it at that systemic uh, large scale level for the country, at the education system, which we are trying to get as many uh, children from rural urban India to go to, uh, we probably have half our battle uh, won if you're doing a great job of it by taking care of the other uh, SDGs uh, that can be accounted for through sport. Um, so I think school is a great place and great to see that a lot of uh, the studies are showing that we are now working in educational institutions. The second one, gender equality, why I keep asking myself this question in my daily work on the ground. Till now, we have parents saying that I'm unhappy that I had a girl, hence I need to produce a boy. Till now, we are struggling and there are organizations trying to make sure that every girl goes to school. And till now, we are trying to make sure that the age of 13, a girl doesn't have to drop out of school. And we are making adequate organizations and resources to make sure girls have time to study. And then what Aishwarya said, right, about mothers making informed decisions. Uh, so I think the whole gender equality piece, if now built into the education system and looked at it that way, takes care of good health and well-being, social inclusion, and builds for, I think, a solid foundation to then take care of youth development and everything uh, henceforth. I personally have a preference for gender equality. I have seen the struggle firsthand. I have struggled to get girls to play. And it's been extremely, extremely painful to see mothers and fathers let all their sons play and literally not even allow their girls to try their hand at the sport. And I think that really makes me realize, and this is still date, right, in 2020, all the way from when I started in 2010 and 11. And hence, I think these two need most attention. I choose them for now. Thanks. Thank you, Neha, for putting your, you know, your mic behind your word. Uh, I must tell you, I, I was chairing and uh, I was hosting an earlier panel on sports for women. And I ended out with saying that 50 years from now, we will host another panel and it will not be on sports for women or women empowerment and all of that kind of crap. But it will be on men empowerment because women would have taken over. So it will take us another 50 years. Don't worry, Neha, we'll get that. 
So here, would you like to end uh, with your quick two? I know you've already you the with the research insights, and then we will end today's session. Sure. Um, happy to be put on the spot, and I have to actually pick the same <laughs> ones as Neha. Um, gender equality, um, number one, because it's interconnected with many other uh, development outcomes as well as SDGs. So if we can have an impact on that, we'll have an impact on many others. And also because of the fact Neha just ha beautifully highlighted all those issues that still exist. Uh, and, and that's why uh, gender equality has to be on the top of my list. And second would be, again, ed improving educational outcomes. And I say that because um, a lot of S4D programming works is uh, uh, aligned with education. Uh, but also uh, the new education policy uh, of 2020 actually broadens the scope of education. Um, um, and I think sport can have a very crucial role to play in achieving that broadened uh, um, educational outcomes. So, so same, uh, uh, same uh, two as Neha, uh, a slightly um, different um, as to why I would choose them. Thank you. Thank you, Suhail. Thank you, Aishwarya. Thank you, Neha. It has been wonderful and such a learning experience for me, particularly. Uh, you know, I didn't know so much was happening in this area, and there was so much of there was a framework, there are policy, and there are people who are such big advocates, uh, not to mention those who are actually building the initiatives uh, and measuring those. So, thank you so very, very much for being uh, part of this fireside chat, Suhail. Your scoping study that Fiki is very, very happy to partner you with. Uh, we are truly going to spread it as much as we can uh, through our entire uh, set of 200 or 1,000 members. It needs to be seen, it needs to be read, and it needs to go to those who will uh, take decisions, um, both policy, policy and take action commercially. So thank you very, very much. With this, we complete our two wonderful days of thought-provoking sessions on you know, various topics surrounding the business. Uh, all of us are really, really thankful to everyone who has joined us over the past couple of days. We truly value your participation. Shri Kiran Rijiju, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. Shri Heman Sorenji, Honorable Chief Minister of Jharkhand. Srimati Yashodhara Sindhya, Honorable Minister, Department of Sports and Youth Welfare, Technical Education, Skill Development and Employment for the Government of Madhya Pradesh. Mr. Matt Carroll, CEO, Australian Olympic Committee. Of course, the inimitable PV Sindhu, uh, globally renowned badminton player in our, you know, pride and joy. Ms. Luisa Lino Oliveira, Trade Commissioner, Embassy of Portugal in India. Mr. Gitesh Agarwal, Trade Commissioner, Queensland. Mr. Inigo Bonilla, Head Strategic Alliances, JSIC. All the jury members of Fiki India Sports Awards 2020 and all the panelists, including the ones that I have here sitting with me. Uh, a big, big round of applause to all of you. Thank you on behalf of Fiki for your support and guidance in putting together this wonderful program. TURF 2020 was supported by Star India, the title partner, Mobile Premier League, Dream 11, Manav Rachna Educational Institutions, Odisha Mining Corporation, Jharkhan and Odisha States, uh, as partner states, Center for Sports Sciences, Tata Steel, Edelweiss Group, International Institute of Sports Management, Winning Matters, Black Aviat, and Words Work LLP. Uh, thank you all for being the support and the backbone for the 10th edition of TURF, what we call this year, TURF 2020. 12 sessions and this seminar, and I'd like to take this opportunity also to congratulate all the winners of the India Sports Awards. And I know that the next time TURF 2021 happens, we're going to come back. We're going to be at the summit. The world is going to be a better and safer place to live in. And India would have definitely won several, several more medals at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. So everyone, 
stay well, stay safe, and let's wish 2021 is a year that we will all, all remember as an amazing year to come. Why we forget 2020? Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Again, Aishwarya, Neha, Sohil, thank you so very much for being here. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.